Last month, we started looking at the new Flat Earth documentary, Level With Me. And we tried our best to be as thorough as possible. Today, we'll continue in that same vein and look at the next section of the documentary. This is Debunking a Flat Earth Documentary, Part 2. Welcome along to another episode of Flat Earth Friday with me, Simon Dan. Thank you very much for joining me. Before we begin today, a massive thank you to the sponsors of today's video, Magic Spoon. Now, Magic Spoon is cereal reinvented. It's that same taste that you remember as a kid, but upgraded with grown-up ingredients. Nothing artificial. The Magic Spoon fits a variety of lifestyles. It's high protein, keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, wheat-free, and naturally flavoured. Magic Spoon cereal has only got 140 calories per serving, with zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and four to five net grams of carbs per serving. Now the Magic Spoon cereal bars, which are delicious by the way, have only got 130 calories per serving, with one gram of sugar, 10 grams of protein, and four net grams of carbs per bar. Now, you can click the link below to get some Magic Spoon cereal today, and you can build your very own variety box and use my code SIMANDAN to get $5 off. Now, you can choose from the best-selling cocoa, fruity frosted, peanut butter, and maple waffle flavors, plus other awesome flavors including honey nut, blueberry muffin, birthday cake, and cinnamon roll. You can also add the cookies and cream and cocoa peanut butter cereal bars to your variety box, like I did. And Magic Spoon is so confident in its product that it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund you your money no questions asked. So click the link below or scan the QR code on the screen and use the code SIMANDAN to get $5 off or go to magicspoon.com slash SIMANDAN to get $5 off your order today. Also for my Canadian and UK fans, Magic Spoon now ships to Canada and the UK. Right, back to today's video. And what I love most about these debunkings of these documentaries is the debunkings that we make actually gain more views and more exposure than the documentaries themselves. So far in total, these documentary busting videos have amassed over 1.2 million views. So without further ado, let's get on with this one, shall we? So if you remember, we were busy dealing with the accusation that the 1986 Challenger disaster was a fake. Let's pick up where we left off. Dick Scobie had a company called Cows and Trees, and when you went to his website, there was an animation of a cow taking off like a rocket with a smoke stream coming out of its backside, doing a twisty curl in the air that looked remarkably just like what we saw with the Challenger. Okay, first off, it looks nothing like it. And secondly, so what? Cows and Trees is a marketing agency. Why wouldn't they have something like this on their website? I mean, this is absolutely reaching, even for you guys. And after we started making videos on that and it started going viral, that website disappeared, never to be seen again. Yeah, because you harassed them, I expect, to the point where it wasn't even worth it anymore. Sickening behavior. And nobody could have predicted back in 1986 that in 30 some odd years from then, that there would be something called the internet that would bring all this information to the tip of your fingers and you'd be able to search through pictures, Facebooks, websites, profiles, now these people are scared. They're hiding their profiles, they're deleting their websites, they're making their Facebooks private. You lot have got a big opinion of yourselves, don't you? People do all that stuff anyway, for a variety of reasons. Anazuka and McNair are always together. They're hanging out at NASA and always talking about themselves. Ellison Onizuka, if you look at clips of him back in 1986 when this happened, he actually spoke like, uh, every other word was, uh... Let me say that uh, it's really a pleasure to be back. Uh, if you look at clips of his brother, Claude, now speaking, it's the same exact thing. Every other word is, uh... But uh, Allison's dream is continued to be carried on. Uh, I think we got some... Uh, we're very fortunate that the... Uh, uh, I think uh, we're ready to go fly. Thanks for uh, being out here today. Yes, his brother was only three years younger than him. They would have had almost identical upbringings, so it's no surprise that they talk similar. His brother just so happens to be the spokesperson for the Challenger tragedy. 
why aren't there any pictures of his brother back when this happened? Why didn't his brother speak at the funeral? Use your head. Oh yeah, massive surprise that an astronaut's brother is involved with his memory. Massive surprise. Former Governor Ariyoshi, who has a story about a picture that survived the Challenger disaster. Ellison only just came to see me one day and he wanted a family photo. And he wanted to take it up on a Challenger and he's going to bring it back, inscribe it, and autograph it. But that Challenger accident happened and I felt very sorry to lose Elson. But I didn't even think about the photo. I thought everything else must have been destroyed completely. About two months later, Lon Onizuka called me and told me that they found in the water, NASA found the uh, personal preference kit of uh, Elton Onizuka. And she said, there were two things in there. One was a monk, monk's uh, prayer, and the other was his family portrait. Wow, what a shambles. This is not a photo of the Onizaka family. This is a photo of Governor Ariyoshi's family, as in the old man holding the photo in this clip. Flat Earthers doing their own research there like never before. So I told her, oh, then it must be in terrible condition because the astronauts, uh, the, uh, the big bang up and the ocean in the water for two months. She told me, no, it's in perfect condition. And she said, I'm gonna bring the picture over to you and give it to you. And then in the meantime, NASA got the picture and they put this together for us. And that took three minutes to research and it says a lot about the Flat Earther's honesty there, doesn't it? Ronald McNair conveniently has a twin brother named Carl McNair who looks exactly like him. Again, this is poor research. Carl was Ronald's older brother, not his twin. However, the age gap was less than a year, so it's not surprising that they look alike. And is at a lot of the events now, but was nowhere to be found when the explosion happened. So what does this prove? He does state that he was watching the launch on TV, but I guess you guys aren't gonna buy that. Krista McAuliffe was a fairly new teacher just three years at that school. To get her story planted, all of these people, the parents, the astronauts, everyone involved that you saw, you know, a crisis actor. Crisis actor. As he was at the Cape in the stands to see Tuesday's launch, a sight that she says still haunts her. Why didn't I leave too? But I thought, no, I wanna stay and see it. And as she read Mike's invitation for the launch, Ms. Hesse said that she doesn't know if she'll be emotionally ready for a service like that in his hometown. Since I won't be able to see you all in person, let me say thanks for coming and have a great time. And I hope you see a good show. George Bush Sr. hand-selected the teacher, Krista McCullough. What are the odds that 30 years later, there is a professor at Syracuse University with the name Sharon McCullough. What are the odds? Well, apparently there's over 8,000 people in the US with the surname McAuliffe. So the odds are fairly high, aren't they? I still can't believe that I'm gonna actually be going into that shuttle. It just, it, it just really doesn't seem possible. Krista McAuliffe was asked if she had any fears about her space shuttle flight. People really feel that space travel is safe now. It, it's not that earlier feeling that, oh, it's going to blow up or something's going to happen. Right at this point, I feel that I'll be okay if I go off. Well, where's Jarvis? How come you haven't located him? And the answer is, you know, he could have died of natural causes, a heart attack, a car accident, you know, three, four, five years later, and it would never be reported. Or you couldn't find someone with the same name that looks vaguely similar. The reason they did it was a psychological operation to justify not doing manned space flights anymore and to pull on your heartstrings with an emotional cover. So if you dare question it, then you know you're immoral. And then when you look into it, you find out, of course, that you have all these people still existing in the world. So basically a uh, government version of witness protection for NASA. What? What's funny about this is that non-flat earth people with a logical brain can look at this and say, the people you think look alike don't look alike. A flat earther is actively looking for things to support their belief. You guys genuinely see what you want to see. Our nation held a vigil by our television sets. In one cruel moment, our exhilaration turned to horror. We waited and watched. They were waiting and watching. When they saw the explosion, there was confusion. Was something wrong? The principal and teachers weren't certain either. Then it got very quiet as the horror of it began to register. Besides the trauma-based mind control and putting children through that, that trauma, it also, it reinforces 
their model. It reinforces their religion. Trauma-based mind control. What even? And how exactly does a space shuttle exploding reinforce the fact that the Earth is spherical? Because it doesn't. It reinforces the fact that space flight is hard and accidents can happen. Look, all that this terrible thing happened. We're trying to go to space. We're trying, you know, trying to explore and for science. But oh, look, all those people died. But at one o'clock, school was closed. It had to close. I felt as if uh, my whole body blew up inside when I saw that. And I can just never be as shocked as I am now. And I get that. I can only imagine what it must have felt like watching that unfold with my own eyes. Seeing it with my own eyes, it really just scared me. Some astronauts blow up in a rocket. What does that do subconsciously to the average person? They don't want to go up into space. They don't want to blow up in a rocket. We'll leave that to the professionals. We'll leave that to, to NASA and our government. Yet more people are trying to be astronauts today, probably, than ever before. What does that tell you? Once they had seen the evidence on the visual screen that there would be no survivors, it suddenly became apparent to them that they were dealing with death. The government had incentivized the different public schools to play the challenger in their classroom. So they rolled their TV sets out, they had all the children sit down and get ready to watch it, and 20% of the American public watched the challenger event happen live. And within one hour, 80% of Americans had seen the challenger tragedy happen. So just like with 9-11, they have everyone see this traumatic event and then we're all in unison that we're traumatized. What's funny to me about all of this is the Flat Earthers, they just come up with reasons and then that's that. No evidence, no proof, just reasons. When it blew up, it was a form of uh, trauma-based mind control that you know some people will never grow out of and then the emotions kick in and you're unable to think logically about what's going on. Of course this was planned. They made every school show this event live. They wanted these kids to grow up defending this tragedy. Now correct me if I'm wrong, but if a school teacher becomes the first civilian to be selected for space flight, does it then make sense that all schools watch this space shuttle launch? Think about how many field trips come here, unfortunately. Yeah. And they go in and watch that Heroes and Legends thing, and they come out thinking that yeah. this is the greatest possible hero that they could ever be. And that's just, they're actors. <laughs> and we're building them up higher than your father, police, military, all these people that are actual heroes. These are actors working for a government agency, so. Next. Hello, Hi. I'm gonna get one of these signed if that's all right. Oh my, I can feel a cringy questioning coming, can't you? My name is Justin. Justin? Yes. I-N? Yes, with an I-N. Where are you from, Justin? Orlando. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> You're not far from Not too far. No, I'm okay on a picture, but thank you. I do have a question though. Oh, I knew it. Here we go. Get ready to hide behind your face palm protection. Sometimes when we're watching the uh, ISS footage, you'll see the uh, astronauts sometimes connected to like wires and harnesses. Is that to keep them like in the frame during the broadcast or what's the reason for that? Oh my days, the secondhand embarrassment is too much for me to take. The front of this guy asking an actual astronaut why they use wires. You know, I haven't actually... You mean while they're inside the shuttle? Yeah, like when they're inside the ISS, sometimes during the feeds, the broadcast, you'll oh, see kind of yes, it, um, pulling on their belts or something like I that. I bet that is. I have, like I that? Bet, I bet that is. I have, I have, I have not personally seen that. Oh, really? But I know that they, you know, they try to be still when they're doing right. talking to someone. Um, they're talking to someone, and then they usually try to release and do like a flip at the end yeah. or something like that. Yeah, because I've seen the yeah. flip before, and it almost looked like a foot was caught, like, inside something, but there was nothing really there. It was really strange. I didn't know if there was something to kind of like hold them in place or something. Yeah, there's anchor points all over the ISS. That's what he was trying to latch on to. We never had anything like oh, that, okay. but they may have learned over time that it was hard to stay still and they yeah. came up with something. Did you, um, did you ever think the public would find out that all the spacewalks were filmed underwater? Thanks, sir. <laughs> <laughs> did you have any comment on that? Well, we train underwater. Oh, okay, Thanks, but only training? Only training. Okay. Bless her, she's humoring him a bit. I'll be telling her to do one. Most of the public have no idea that the ISS is located in an underwater neutral buoyancy lab in Houston, Texas. Sorry, let me just correct that statement. Most of the general public don't know that a full-scale mock-up of some of the ISS modules is located in the neutral buoyancy lab in Houston, Texas. The space station footage that they trick us with is not traveling at 17,500 miles per hour above your head. It's all being filmed here on Earth. 
An exact ISS replica underwater. Coincidence? Well, no. The ISS is 108 metres long. The pool at the Neutral Buoyancy Lab is only 62 metres long. So no, not an exact replica. And why are you calling it a replica? Are you inferring that there is actually an ISS somewhere else? Hang on a minute, you just said that they remove the water and green screen the space in. So if they do that, why are they still getting bubbles? Because they've removed the water. That's because they aren't bubbles, they are ice crystals flying off the ISS. The International Space Station, that's a complete fraud. It's a complete hoax. I don't believe that all these astronauts are living up there and doing all this. Every single time that they do some type of live demonstration, you can see some type of faulty wiring, some type of glitch. They're literally being held up by strings. Green screens, wires, um, CGI, uh, you know, augmented reality, all sorts of issues. Think about this. They always have the women with long flowing hair. That would never be allowed. They literally spray hairspray <laughs> in their hair to make it look like their hair is floating in zero gravity. The International Space Station brought to you by the same guys who faked six moon missions. Yeah, I believe that. You know, I don't know exactly how they're uh, videotaping themselves. They could be on one of those zero G planes and, um, you know, doing it all in there. I'm not sure how they're doing it, but I don't believe it at all. It looks like a bunch of green screen. Well, if you took the time to look at the 50 minute ISS tour, you will find that the ISS can't be debunked. It's literally the black swan of space flight. You cannot debunk that video. Level Earth Observer tried and failed. I know I keep banging on about that video, but I feel strongly about it. It's undebunkable. Final challenge video coming for that soon, by the way. Right, let's leave the Level With Me crew there for another few weeks and finish today's video by saying we are all done and dusted for another Flat Earth Friday. Thanks so much for watching, it truly is appreciated. I'll leave a link in the description for the first part of this uh, documentary debunking. If you haven't seen that yet, go back and check that out. Um, and there are also debunkings for the other two Flat Earth documentaries that they released. Again, I'll leave links for those in the description. Check those out. If you really enjoyed it today, please do consider subscribing. And again, hit the like button if you did like it. Just enough time to once again thank Magic Spoon for sponsoring today. So click the link in the description or scan the QR code and use the code SIMANDAN for $5 off. Or go to magicspoon.com slash SIMANDAN to get $5 off your order today. I've been Simon Dan, have yourselves a great weekend and I'll see you on Tuesday for more Mandela Effect fun, this time involving Gordon Ramsay. See you then. <laughs>